What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting mob discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video if you're checking out. This show currently on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts through our podcast version. Welcome in. I hope you enjoy the show. Make sure you leave us a detailed review and a five-star rating. Welcome in, everybody. This is episode 128 of The Sit Down, and I am your host, Jeff Nadu. And I'm sure if you're watching on YouTube right now, maybe you don't actually know, besides the YouTube channel, we do have a podcast. and We have 127 episodes, now 128 you can check out. Keep in mind, if you're watching on YouTube, there are many shows in our audio platform you probably haven't heard and of people you probably want to hear about. So make sure you check it out. If you're on YouTube, the link to the podcast is in the description of this video. Let's get in, everybody, as always, to a brand new episode of the show. I thank you, as always, for being here and for supporting what we're doing here. Today, we're going to get in, as normally, to this show talking about a family within a family. And if you know anything about the mafia, the hierarchy generally have people with a lot of the same last names, right? When it comes to the Gambino family, we hear the name Gotti. When it comes to the uh, Colombo family, you hear the name Persico. There are a lot of families within a family. And today we're going to talk about one of those families, one of the most powerful groups between the 80s, 90s, and 2000s in the Gambino crime family. The story of Nicholas Little Nicky Carrazzo next on the sit-down. Now, I know when you talk about Nicky Carrazzo, you got to talk about JoJo Carrazzo. I am, though, going to do a separate show at some point on JoJo. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about those two today, um, as well as his other two brothers, uh, Blaze and Anthony. Both have kind of interesting stories as well, but... I want to focus on Nicky Carrazzo because, to me, he is the more interesting of the four brothers. Now, as I said, we'll get into JoJo down the road. Let's get into it. Little Nick Carrazzo on the sit-down. Nick Carrazzo was born March 17th, 1940, in the New York borough of Brooklyn. He would grow up at 1825 Pitkin Avenue in the Ocean Hill, Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Now, I know that there are parts of Brooklyn that over the years have changed considerably, but I understand that in the 50s, when little Nick Carrazzo and his brothers were growing up, Brownsville Brownsville was still fairly Italian, as well as Canarsie, East New York. A lot of gangsters in the Gambino crime family grew up in these areas. Fat, and, Fat Andy Ruggiano, Nick Carrazzo, um, the Carneglias, John Gotti, Angelo Ruggiero, all of them grew up, Faticos, they all grew up in this general vicinity. Mikey Paradiso, he grew up in Canarsie. Uh, members of the Lucchese family, Little Al Diarco grew up. This is all, and, and again, all these areas are very close to the Flatlands and down to Bensonhurst and all these different areas. So all these general areas, at one point, maybe not now, but at one point were fairly Italian. And Little Nick Carrazzo would grow up alongside several other brothers. In fact, three brothers, which would all in some way follow him into the life. His brother, Joseph Jojo Carrazzo, uh, would at one point for a long period of time be the consigliere of the Gambino crime family. It was chosen at one point in the heyday of John Gotti to be his driver. If you've ever seen videos of Gotti entering the Ravenite, uh, Jojo Carrazzo can always be seen with him uh, in unison. Now, Little Nick had two other brothers, one of which was Blaze Carrazzo. Now, it said that Blaze Carrazzo was a made member of the Gambino family. Blaze would ultimately have a son at one point, a kid called Nick, and he would actually be arrested for uh, his behavior and being connected to the mob as well. The Carrazzos had another brother who was actually a twin to Blaze Carrazzo, a brother called Anthony. Now, Anthony, pretty interesting guy. Uh, Anthony would actually own uh, several jewelry locations, one of which was in Manhattan. 
And down the road, he would actually take up acting, Anthony Carrazzo would. He can be seen in the film A Bronx Tale. While it was a small part, he's a customer. He's called a customer in Shea Bippy. So we'd have to imagine he was some sort of extra acting as a member of Sonny's crew or an associate. And he's hanging out in the bar of the Shea Bippy in the Bronx where Sonny did his business out of. Now, Anthony Carrazzo had another very interesting role. And if it's a it's a blink, if blinking, you might miss it uh, part. But it is in a fairly important episode of The Sopranos. There's an episode in season one. I believe it's episode four. And it's called Pax Soprana. It's when they um, honor Junior Soprano at a, a ceremony, if you will, and a dinner. Obviously, we can see James Gandolfini directly next to Junior the guy to the right of Gandolfini is actually Anthony Carrazzo. He would be a, a character called Kevin Sharkey. Now, he would not have a speaking role, but he was seen and can be noted as he's likely some sort of soldier in the DeMeo crime family. So kind of an interesting role. It's always cool to see that photo, knowing that you're in it and you're acting. I guess if you were going to act, uh, that would be a, a good place to be. We have to wonder, uh, how did he get to be in that role? I guess we'll wonder about that. Either way, pretty cool life. Sadly, Anthony Carrazzo would die in 2020 uh, after he had uh, onset dementia. Now, let's get back to Nick Carrazzo. Nick Carrazzo uh, would come up generally in Ocean Hill and, and Brownsville. He would move around a lot in Canarsie as well, which kind of borders this area. Uh, Nick Carrazzo was doing his thing. And from what I understand, he and his brother, uh, both came up as hijackers. They stole a lot of things. In fact, even into the 80s, it was said little Nick uh, oversaw a car theft ring in Queens and Brooklyn. Now, from what I've heard, and again, this is a story that I'm going to reference, but I'm going to kind of understand that we don't know it to be true as fact. And I want it to be made clear that I think when we talk about the mafia, we assume that fights, let's say a fight happens in the 50s. Some people assume that in the 90s, those people still hate each other. Remember that people fight a lot. In fact, I talked to one guy that was a member of the mafia, and he would tell me at one point that fighting was extremely normal. And just because you fight with somebody doesn't mean you're going to hate them forever. In fact, he would say there were guys that I'd fight with, and a month later, we'd be having dinner together. So it's kind of a norm. Now, we have heard in the early life uh, of John Gotti that he got into fracases with certain people, one of which was Mickey Boy Paradiso. We've heard stories that uh, there was some sort of slap involving Paradiso and Gotti, but they would remain friends and were very close into the 80s. Now, according to Anthony Ruggiano, son of Fat Andy Ruggiano, Ruggiano would state that, according to him, he had heard a story that in the 60s, John Gotti and little Nick Carrazzo would get into some sort of argument and uh, fight. Uh, it happened uh, on uh, the uh, one of the infamous parkways in Brooklyn. Uh, I can, I'll be named Jackie Robinson Boulevard, I believe. Supposedly, there was some sort of argument. They got into it. And several people have claimed that's the reason that little Nick wasn't made capo right away. But I've talked to people that were in the family or connected to the family, and they would tell me that, it really wasn't something that was a big deal when you're an associate, which these guys were at the time you get into scraps, but there was always like a, a certain tenuous maybe issue between the two, but it didn't last for decades as people made it out to be. Now, little Nick Carrazzo would come up under the tutelage of legendary Canarsie gangster, Anthony Ruggiano, fat Andy, they would call him. And according to his son, he would say that in that neighborhood, Pretty much every young gangster in the neighborhood looked up to Fat Andy Ruggiano. People like little Nick Carrazzo, Lenny Di Maria, John Gotti, Angelo Ruggiero. And they all gave him a certain mystique. Keep in mind, Fat Andy was about 10 years their senior. So he was kind of that upper level guy that everybody wanted to be like. But according to Anthony Ruggiano, he would say that little Nick Carrazzo was not like John Gotti. He was literally a carbon copy of his father, Anthony Ruggiano. Now, in 1970, I found an interesting article from the New York Times 
which claims that in 1970, Fat Anthony Ruggiano allegedly ran a $50 million a year gambling operation and that not only was little Nick Carrazzo involved in that, but so was his brother, Jojo Carrazzo. According to Brooklyn DA Eugene Gold, he would say that Carrazzo, alongside his brother, Lenny DiMaria and Fat Andy Ruggiano, oversaw a huge bookmaking ring involving sports and horses, and that little Nick Carrazzo was something called a figure room controller. Now, being in the gambling world, I've obviously spoke to many people that were gamblers. A figure room is essentially a wire room, and it's where bets are taken, bets are placed, and bets are tallied. And little Nick kind of oversaw that operation, according to the Brooklyn DA. Fat Andy Ruggiano was said to be the ringleader, and these guys made a ton of money. Keep in mind, this is in 1970. $50 million a year is a ton of of action you'd have to figure quite some handsome profits that were coming in to fat andy ruggiano and the crew now obviously as the 70s play themselves out many gangsters in the mafia most notably in the gambino family are making their come-ups right the 70s was the year for guys that would ultimately become the hierarchy of the gambinos down the road people like Gotti, people like sammy gravano people like little nick carrazza the problem was the books were closed and little Nick was waiting alongside his brother uh, for his call-up. Luckily for him, the books would open in the mid-70s, and Carrazzo would get his call. Now, as we know, um, it would all kind of come in unison. But in April of 1977, little Nick, at the age of 37, would be entered in to the Gambino crime family. His sponsor was Fat Andy Ruggiano. Now, according to multiple reports, when the books opened, Little Nick sponsor Fat Andy initially refused to put up any of his crew. But it would be later decided that his most favorite associate, Nick Carrazza, would be proposed. Now, around this time, Ruggiano um, had volunteered Carrazzo and fellow Ruggiano crew member Lenny Di Maria to do work for people like Carmine Fatico. Now, once Gene... Gotti was inducted, Ruggiano brought an unspecified complaint to Neil Delacroche. Now, according to the details, the implication was that Fat Andy Ruggiano was offended that Gene Gotti had been made before little Nick Carrazzo. Soon after Delacroche informed Ruggiano that Carrazzo was set to be inducted, Delacroche himself would sponsor Lenny Di Maria as a gift. So Fat Andy wasn't exactly happy. That shows you how much respect and love he had for little Nick. He believed he should be one of the first people made when the books had opened, which is a big regard when it came to little Nick Carrazzo. Now, in the ceremony in April 1977, held at a home in Brooklyn, made alongside little Nick, was Lenny DiMaria, Tommy Agro, and a man called Frank DiStefano. Now, we referenced Frank DiStefano in a show we did pretty recently on Joe and Gallo here, he was essentially the number two to Joe and Gallo. He was his driver, very involved in his day to day. Uh, so that was a pretty, you know, high level making ceremony, a lot of higher end guys there. We all know how much of a lunatic uh, Tommy Agra was obviously Lenny Di Maria becomes a capo down the road and little Nick. Um, so little Nick is good. Everything's working out for him. Uh, Mid-70s, he's in his mid-30s, late 30s, he's a made member. Now, he would be placed, obviously, in the continued crew of Fat Andy Ruggiano, which was a very uh, powerful group. And we would think by this point, uh, the feud that he supposedly had with John Gotti probably died down. I think we have to, again, remember, just because you fight someone as a young kid in the 60s, remember in the 60s, Carrazzo was in his 20s. So was Gotti. In fact, Carrazzo and Gotti were born in the same year, 1940. It's not something that didn't make him cat. Like, that's not true. I, I've heard a lot of people say it. it's not true. Okay. It just isn't. I'm sure Gotti respected the hell out of Carrazzo and Carrazzo respected Gotti. Did they have a beef at some point? Maybe. But Carrazzo made a bunch of money. And John Gotti in the end was a very smart guy. Again, I say this all the time. 
there are way too many people on YouTube and, and podcasts and stuff that try to paint John Gotti as a dumb idiot. That's not true. John Gotti was extremely smart. He was extremely calculated. And he understood maybe in my – like, for instance, it was referenced many times that John Gotti um, had issues with Joe the Cat. At one point, he called Joe the Cat a heartless motherfucker on on audio. It didn't mean he hated him. He loved the money. They were all business. How many people do you work with that are watching? How many people do you work with that you don't like? But if you're a, a person and you have a business, and while you may not like the kind of guy someone is, you still like the money they're, give, they're giving you. You know, it's you got to deal with it. Not everybody's personalities connect. One thing was for sure, little Nick was an earner. He was making a ton of money and everything from loan sharking to bookmaking to extortion. Uh, had people doing car thefts. All sorts of money was coming in. And look, I've talked to people like Howie Santos. Howie Santos was directly connected to Little Nick's brother, Jojo Carrado. Those guys were making a bunch of money, whether it was in Canarsie. And eventually, Little Nick would move his operation uh, to uh, Ozone Park. He, he ran around in Ozone Park, Howard Beach, East New York. I mean, there, there was a huge swath of territory for the Carrazos. They were doing good, and things were working out. Eventually, little Nick Carrazzo would become a Kappa regime in the Gambino crime family. And as we know, eventually, uh, we don't need to talk about how John Gotti went away. Everybody knows when he went away. Uh, and as he goes away, we all know that the acting boss, per se, is his son, John A. Gotti, a.k.a. Junior Gotti. Now, what we would find is the Gambino crime family, he was the top-level decision maker, John Gotti Jr., However, John Gotti realized that to make everybody happy, we need to make sure we have certain people that are right up there with you. He basically said, my son is the decision maker, but my brother's involved. Jackie Nose is involved. Joe Arcuri is involved. Jimmy Brown's going to be involved. Little Nick's involved. Now, Jimmy Brown, until he goes to prison, is on the committee. He then goes to prison. Nick Carrazzo is added to the group. So little Nick is a capo, but he's also being a decision maker in the family. Now, one thing we are aware of is in 1992, it seems like little Nick and Jojo Carrazzo or, or uh, Junior Gotti have a good uh, relations. In fact, according to the testimony of Michael, Mikey Scars D. Leonardo, he would talk about the story involving how it all worked out when Curtis Sliwa, the popular uh, radio uh, show host and Guardian Angels founder, was shot. Now, as we know, he was not supposed to be shot. And I'm going to talk about the back and forth because little Nick is given this job. And I want to talk about what we would hear from Mikey Scars. According to the testimony, Mikey Scars would go to something called the Carousel Diner. And he would sit down at a table with certain individuals. He was asked, who was seated at the table at the diner? Scars would respond, myself, John Jr., Nikki Carrazzo, Joey D'Angelo, and Michael Yanati. Now, Michael Yanati was an associate of Little Nick. Now, upon them sitting down, he would say, John Jr. would say, quote, you guys are brought here to do a piece of work for this family. And Mikey Scarger responded, he thought that meant that they were killing somebody. Now, John Jr. would continue the discussion saying, quote, yes, he named Curtis Sliwa. He was fed up and very angry, and he wanted Nikki Carrazzo to handle this and have this guy severely hurt, put in the hospital, a severe hospital beating. Now, the lawyer would ask, when John Gotti is saying this about how he wants Sleela hurt, who is he directing this order to? Scars would respond, Nikki Carrazzo, Michael Yanati, and Joey D'Angelo. He would then be asked, and when Gotti Jr. mentioned Curtis Sliwa, was that the first time you understood who the intended victim was? To which Scars would respond, yes. Now, also, he's asked, when John Gotti announces that the intended victim is Curtis Sliwa, did he say why he wanted him attacked? 
Mikey Scars would respond, yes, like I said. Saliba just wouldn't stop. He was just lambasting the whole family, especially, like I said, the Gotties. John Sr., the guy got convicted, just leave him alone. I believe he started also picking on Vicky, John's sister, and Gene Gotti with drugs, calling him a drug dealer and all this other stuff. He just wouldn't let it go. The guy was already convicted. Now, Scars would then be asked, according to Gotti, how is this plan going to be carried out? Scars would respond, Nikki Carraza was going to handle all the details and how it was going to be done. He was supposed to meet up with Nikki and Joey D'Angelo and Yanati and follow Nikki's direction on what the plan would be and how it was carried out. Now, obviously, as we know, Sleeva was supposed to be beaten up. Okay, not shot, not killed, beaten up, you know, with baseball bats or pipes or something. In the end, he was shot getting into a, a taxi cab. Now, Curtis Lee was, would survive and is still alive today. Uh, but this was something that, according to Mikey Scars, Nikki Carrazzo was very much involved in and essentially put this all in motion. Now, we could say that this probably could have been done without Nikki Carrazzo, but being a captain and being a respected member of the family, his people were asked to handle it, and he was the go-between. So someone was assaulted pretty badly and shot at and involved Carrazzo. So this is just one of the things that were involved in this. Now, Nicky Carrazzo would have problems of his own. In 1996, from what I understand, he is at a beach in Florida, Key Biscayne, and he is swimming in the ocean. And the feds show up and he's walking out of the ocean and he's arrested, which is a wild. I mean, we may have to do a show on how people are arrested. Generally, you're in your bed sleeping, but sometimes they want to make a point. They'll march down on the beach and arrest you. Nicky Carrazzo is brought in here. He can be seen in Miami in his uh, swim trunks. And uh, that looks like some kind of Hawaiian shirt, if you will. Um, and look, it's during December, right before Christmas. We'd have to figure he was getting away from the cold weather. Uh, now, according to the federal government, he is charged with racketeering, including loan sharking. After it was found that he was allegedly doing business out of a check cashing operation in Deerfield Beach, Florida, where he was charging interest uh, rates of up to 260%. Uh, now, <laughs> this is one of the great comments of all time. Nikki Carrazzo's in court. His lawyer is his nephew, Joseph Carrazzo Jr., the son of his brother, Joseph Carrazzo. Now, his brother is a mob lawyer. Everybody knows that. He represents all sorts of gangsters. At one point, the someone in the case would ask Jojo Carrazzo Jr., what does Nicholas Carrazzo do for a living? To which Joseph Carrazzo Jr. would respond, he is gainfully employed. His son-in-law owns a landscaping business, and Carrazzo assists him. So somehow a landscape laborer has a home in Deerfield Beach, Florida, and a home here and a home there. Uh, again, you always got to laugh at some of these um, you know, comments. But again, it's a court of law. And he's on the books as a landscaping worker. Now, the son-in-law he's referring to is Vincent Marbles Dragonetti. Now, Dragonetti would marry the daughter of Nikki Carrazzo, Bernadette. Uh, and she would uh, actually be someone we'll reference here in a bit uh, due to some of her involvement in another case. Now, for Nikki Carrazzo in this case, he would ultimately uh, have to face the fact that he was going to go to prison. At this time, though, remember, he is on the uh, board of directors in the Gambino crime family, which includes Jackie Knows D'Amico, Junior Gotti. Joe Arcuri, and Peter Gotti. In the end, Nikki Carrazzo would be hit with 60 to 120 months in federal prison. Uh, and he would do around, I don't know, eight years or so. The issue that Nikki Carrazzo, though, has is something that will change his life forever. And it all comes down to an individual he's in prison with a guy called Joe Valaro. Now, we've referenced Joe Valaro in a show I did on Frank Cali a long time ago. Joe Valaro is probably in the 2000s, pretty much after Mikey Scars. Joe Valaro is probably uh, one of the biggest informants 
that the Gambino crime family has had over the last 20-ish years in a family that's had many big ones. Joe Villaro is not much talked about, but I want to kind of give you a little background on Joe Villaro. Joe Villaro was a kid who lived in Staten Island. His father, at one point, it was said he was a big bookmaker in New Jersey for the Gambino family. He's associate, guy Anthony Villaro. Joe Villaro ultimately created two trucking companies. Uh, what they essentially did is they hauled dirt uh, from city and borough locations. From what I understand, his trucking companies were some of the biggest in the city as far as hauling dirt, He's making a ton of money. Villaro had a company called Andrews Trucking, as well as a company called um, Dump Masters of New York. So he's making a lot of money. Things are good for Joe Villaro. Eventually, though, he gets jammed up in a, um, a beef and he has to go to prison. When he's in prison, he and he's in prison for, I guess, I think loan sharking. He meets little Nick Carrazzo. Now, from what I've heard, Nick Carrazzo was told the guy's no good. Now, what that means, I don't know. From what I've heard, that's what he was told. He then continues to deal with Villar. And what little Nick Carrazzo realizes is this guy's making a ton of money doing trucking and hauling dirt, and we can get our hooks into him. And that's exactly what Nick Carrazzo does. He begins shaking down. And look, Joe Villaro was a bit of what we would call a mob simp. Uh, he wanted to be in the mafia. He was an associate. He had dreams of being made. And I think he thought that the Carrazzo's, most notably Nicky Carrazzo, liked him a lot. And by him kicking up money to him, he could have the protection of the Gambino crime family. And maybe eventually get made into the family and that he was just doling out money just to be around those guys. And this is what members or associates do. Uh, these guys are infatuated with people like Nikki Carrazzo. And even though they create their own businesses and make their own money, they're going to willingly for no reason, give their money to these people. Now, again, at this point, Joe Villaro is probably being leaned on a lot by Nick Carrazzo. And he says, look, I like you kid. Just give me some money. Everything will be fine. We'll work together. We'll get you made at some point. And he was never going to get made, but this kid was dumb enough to believe it. I relate this a lot to, if you've ever seen um, the terrific show on Netflix, Untold Crimes and Penalties, there was an episode featuring a guy called James Galanti. He was the owner of a garbage company in Connecticut. Matty the Horse on Yellow started shaking him down and he was taxing this guy, Galanti. And eventually Galanti went to prison because of it. I kind of related to that in a way. Now, Galanti stood tall, went to prison, is now out in the streets, uh, and is you know still at one point considered an associate. But Joe Villaro, for whatever reason, even though he's making tons of money, he had allegedly given the Gambino family over $400,000 during a two-year period. He, for some ungodly reason, even though he's making a ton of money, he's got a big home, he's got boats. Joe Villaro decides to start selling drugs. Why? We have no idea. Probably one of the dumber things you could ever do. But there's an old saying. Uh, it's not really a saying. It's just my saying. If you're making millions of dollars doing legitimate business like trucking, why do you need to sell drugs? Greed is not good. How many, how many boats can you water ski behind, as they say? Joe Villaro wanted more. He gets jammed up selling drugs. In the mid 2000s. Now, Carrazzo had just gotten out of prison in 2004. And Carrazzo is keeping a low profile. He's, you know, kind of staying out of the way. He's got supervised release, um, but he's still doing what he has to do. Joe Villaro is, is arrested. And Joe Villaro has been caught with two kilos of Coke. And the feds go to him and say, Look, man, you're gone. We're going to give you life for this. You're going away forever. In fact, if you ever get out, you'll be an old man. Now, understand, these guys are not going to make you. They're literally toying with you and stealing from you. What are you going to do here? Because either way, you're either a dead man or you're going to do life in prison. Or you can come with us. We'll whisk you away. And that's that. So what does Joe Villaro do? He cooperates with the federal government. They wire him for sound. And he goes and starts 
taping little Nick Carrazzo and other people. And guess what? Little Nick starts talking, says things. And Joe Villaro, this would lead to Operation Old Bridge, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, during the time between 2005 to 2008, Little Nick is oper operating on a very uh, low basis. Keep in mind, he's in his 60s. He had just got out of prison. He has to be careful. In 2007, he can actually be seen here on surveillance uh, at a wake involving a member of the Gambino crime family. He's off paper by this point. In the photo, we can also see uh, Alphonse Truccio, who uh, at supposedly at one point, Alphonse Truccio was um, kind of the guy in waiting. and He was kind of overseeing certain people in Carrazzo's crew. Keep in mind, Carrazzo was operating at a Bozone Park, which is where Al Truccio is from, his father, Ronnie Truccio. Uh, they were in. And at the wake that night with him was his son-in-law, Vinnie Marbles, Dragonetti. Problem is, chickens would come to roost, if you will, in 2008. And most of the Gambino crime family, the upper echelon, are all arrested. Here, we could see Jojo Carrazzo. We could see Dom Cefalu on the right. And we could see Charles Carniglia, all busted in something called Operation Old Bridge. Now, charges for Nick Carrazzo uh, involved gambling, loan sharking, and two counts of murder. Now, the good thing for him, though, was he got a phone call. This is interesting. According to the feds, Vincent Dragonetti, his son-in-law, was arrested. His wife, Bernadette, who was Nikki's daughter, supposedly called Nikki Carrazzo, and Carrazzo got to his car and left. And went on the lam. And he was on the lam for four months. So much that he was actually featured on America's Most Wanted. We can see the host, uh, Joe Walsh, I believe his name is, uh, talking about Carrazzo. Now, eventually, Carrazzo decides, I don't want to be on the run forever. I'm going home. Uh, so he does. He walks into the FBI building. One of the great uh, photos of all time. Uh, look at Carrazzo. I mean, by the way, <laughs> there's one thing I'll say with the Gambino family in this time period, uh, whether it's Carrazzo or Junior Gotti or Peter Gotti, they love the tracksuits. I have to admit, I have this exact blue and white tracksuit. It's a Nike tracksuit. Uh, Jojo looks or Nikki looks the part and he has to face the fact that, you know, he's going to go away. Um, this is in 2008. Uh, Nicky Carrazzo is in his late 60s. You go to prison now, you may not get out. You may die there. Ultimately, Nicholas Carrazzo decides that he ain't going to fight it because if he does, he'll likely get life. And he decides to cop and plead guilty. He is sentenced to 15 years in federal prison in April of 2009. Now, Keep in mind, he would initially be incarcerated, little Nick, at the Leavenworth USP uh, prison, the uh, federal prison in Kansas. But he'd later be moved to Florence, uh, which was a uh, essentially the second highest level of prisons outside of the ADX. Keep in mind, there are two different prisons in Florence. There is a high level penitentiary and there is an ADX. Little Nick was at the high security. So he wasn't at the ADX, but he was on one step below that. Little Nick would then be moved to FCI Loretto in Pennsylvania. He would then go to Allenwood, and he would be released in November of 2019 at the age of 79 years old. He would do about 13 years in federal prison. Now, in the end, Little Nick Carrazzo would leave prison. He is still alive today and is 83 years old. It's unclear what Nick Carrazzo does now. However, I would think he's probably just living out the rest of his life in relative anonymity. He is 83 years old and likely does not want to die in federal prison. The world today involving old members of the mafia is a lot different. I think a lot of people like Nick Carrazzo just are willing to take the sparse money they have and maybe receive in legit business and aren't willing to test the government again.
the truth is whether or not the prosecution prosecutions of the federal government still go after the mafia. We know they still do a little bit, but I think people like little Nick Carrazzo uh, generally believe that there's really no reason to continue to battle them. It is what it is. Is he a gangster? Probably not anymore, but always be called one because he's still alive and a member of the Gambino crime family. Little Nick, an interesting guy, definitely a powerful guy, very respected guy. And one of the guys that really kept the wheels of the mob turning really from the late 70s until the mid 2010s. Popular guy, big money maker, and uh, someone who was very respected. That family was respected, the Carrazos, a family inside of a family. If you enjoy this video and you'd like to support us further as far as hitting the like button, please do that. You can also send in a super chat or if you're watching later, hit that super thanks button. And let us know if you appreciate what we're doing here on the show. As always, hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.